glider plane captures the imagination and fuels the fantasies of everyone interested in aviation. World War II was a pressure cooker for fighter aircraft development. In six years of intense combat, the speed and efficiency of fighters increased faster than pre-war designers could possibly have imagined. This is the story of that evolution. The Messerschmitt Bf 109 is one of the classic aircraft of all time. It was produced in greater quantity than any other fighter in history. The first prototype appeared in 1935. The last 109 was produced in Spain in 1957. More than 33,000 were built. At the time of its first flight in 1935, the Bf 109 was the most advanced fighter in the world. The Messerschmitt engineers placed the landing gear attachment points on the fuselage. This reduced weight and made production and repair easier. But for the pilot, it made ground handling tricky. The wheel track was very narrow, which led to instability while taxiing, especially on rough surfaces. Takeoff and landing accidents were common. They still happen today with the few surviving 109s flying. The Messerschmitt design team created the smallest possible airframe into which the largest available engine could be fitted. A measure of the basic design's capacity for development is that the last model, the Messerschmitt BF 109K4, had much the same airframe as the prototype. But it was equipped with a 2,000 horsepower engine, a power increase of 300%. In its long career, spanning the whole of World War II, the BF 109 established itself as one of the greatest combat aircraft in history. It was small, it could be built fast and cheaply. It was easily transported, it had quick acceleration, it could climb and dive fast, it was very nimble in the air. For the pilot, there were drawbacks. The cockpit was tiny and cramped, visibility was poor. In combat, under high G-forces, the leading edge wing slats often opened, throwing the pilot off his aim. But the good outweighed the bad. Early in the war, its only competition was the Spitfire. Even in 1945, 109s could hold their own with many of the newer Allied competitors. The 109's teammate was the BF-110. It was designed as a heavily armed Zerstörer or destroyer. It was supposed to be able to clear the way for German bombers by defeating enemy interceptors over their own territory. When the German military proposed the Zerstörer concept, Professor Willy Messerschmitt was not enthusiastic. But he tried to please Hermann Göring, even though he felt that a large twin-engine fighter would be a compromise. The twin-engined Messerschmitt did well in Poland, in both the bomber escort and ground attack roles. Over Britain, it found the going much tougher. But it re-emerged to prominence as a night fighter against the British area bombing raids. <laughs> 
successor to the BF-110 was planned as early as 1937. It was the 210 Hornisse. The fuselage design and the layout of the tail surfaces were quite different from the 110, but the engines were basically the same. The rear armament was more sophisticated than that of the 110. Remotely controlled guns and barbettes on each side of the fuselage were operated from the rear cockpit. There was a forward bomb bay. In the reconnaissance version, it could house cameras. But in spite of its apparent sophistication, the ME-210 offered little assistance to the German Reich. Early versions had severe stability and landing gear problems. These were improved, but there were still many accidents. Only 352 were built before production was stopped. There was a demand for Willy Messerschmitt's resignation. But design changes led to the 310 and the less radical 410, which was more satisfactory. In 1939, Hawker Hurricanes were the only aircraft in the British Royal Air Force adequate to meet the Germans. But even they had several handicaps. In early models, the propellers were made of wood. Their pitch was fixed. They were very little different from those used on World War I fighters. The wooden propellers limited the Hurricane's speed, rate of climb, and ceiling. But metal three-bladed variable pitch propellers were soon fitted and performance improved. It was the right aircraft at the right time to make a mark in the Battle of Britain. The Hurricane could not match the all-round performance of the BF-109, but it could outturn most other fighters of the time. Eight Browning machine guns gave it heavy firepower. It was devastating against German bombers. Later versions of the Hurricane were developed for the fighter bomber and ground attack roles. They would operate far away from the English Channel and make their mark in some of the more remote theatres of the war. The Hurricane II, equipped with 40mm guns, was extremely effective against Rommel's tanks in the North African desert. These Hurricanes are stationed in Burma, fighting against the onslaught of the Japanese in the Southwest Pacific. Tropicalized Hurricanes were fitted with sand filters under the nose. They could also carry drop tanks for long-range missions. The last Hurricane was delivered in September 1944. By then, around 14,000 had been built. This outmoded design from the mid-1930s turned out to be one of the most enduring contributors to the Allied war effort. The RAF Spitfire was its ace in the hole. In the skies over Dunkirk, it was a rude surprise to the Germans. Early in the war, German intelligence reported that the Messerschmitt Bf 109 was far superior to the Spitfire. In fact, the two aircraft were very close in performance. The Spitfire, with its trademark elliptical wing, had the edge in maneuverability and top speed. The Messerschmitt was better in climb and dive. In the final analysis, victory would depend on the skill of the pilot. This restored Spitfire carries the JEJ -E marking, immortalized by the great British ace, Johnny Johnson. Its home is now in the USA, in California. Rolls-Royce Merlin engines fitted to Spitfires and Hurricanes were the key to their great performance. But Merlins had a drawback. They had carburettors. 
When a Spitfire or Hurricane was pushed over into a dive, the engines promptly died. Fuel-injected Messerschmitts had no such problem. The prototype Spitfire flew in 1936. It had a very long career. Spitfires served throughout the war and were constantly changed and upgraded. Early versions had a top speed just over 350 miles an hour. By the end of the war, this had increased by 100 miles an hour. The Spitfire 14, with a 2,000 horsepower Griffin engine, was fast enough to chase and destroy German V-1 flying bombs. After the Battle of Britain and Germany's move onto the Eastern Front against Russia, RAF fighters were underemployed. They made sweeps into Germany and occupied France. These Spitfires are operated by an RAF Norwegian unit flying sorties into their occupied country from bases in Scotland. Several versions of the Spitfire were modified to increase low altitude performance. The tips of their elliptical wings were clipped. These clipped wing versions carried the designation LF for low altitude fighter. All Spitfire variants were highly maneuverable. But as the war went on, the demands on the Spitfire grew from dogfighting to ground attack and high altitude interception. Altitude interceptors carried the designation HF. The Mark 7 HF had a pressurized cabin. It was powered by a 1600 horsepower Merlin with a two stage supercharger. The wingspan was increased by almost four feet for more efficient high altitude performance. Spitfires flew high and low. They flew in every theater from airstrips and aircraft carriers. They became one of the legendary aircraft of World War II. This is the famous shark's mouth motif that adorned the first American fighter to have an impact on the war. The connection between the shark's mouth and the Curtis Hawk family began with the American volunteer group, the Flying Tigers. The Flying Tigers flew P-40s against Japanese Zeros and Bettys in China before America entered the war. But by then, these fighters had already made their presence felt. The French Army de l'Air began to buy Hawks in 1939. They fought bravely but hopelessly in the ill-fated Battle of France in 1940. The British also bought P-40s early in the war. They called them the Tomahawk and the Kitty Hawk. They were no match for the Messerschmitts in Europe, but they found a real niche in the deserts of North Africa. They may have been obsolete, but they were maneuverable and tough. In the desert, they operated effectively in ground attack and as fighter bombers. P-40s were powered by liquid-cooled Allison or American-built Merlin engines. Their top speed was around 350 miles an hour, and their service ceiling was 30,000 feet. <laughs> 
This is an RAF P-40 in North Africa in 1942. The United States also operated P-40s in North Africa. Experience against the Germans and Italians in this theater was invaluable training for later operations in Europe. The P-40 may not have been the best fighter of World War II, but in China, at Pearl Harbor, on Guadalcanal, in New Guinea, in Russia, and in North Africa, it proved that obsolete doesn't necessarily mean useless. They were built in thousands. Their shark's mouth emblem remains one of the war's most enduring symbols of dogged toughness. In North Africa, the P-40 was opposed to some very interesting and little-known Italian aircraft. This is the Fiat G-50 Freccia, one of the early Italian monoplane fighters. It was first delivered to the Italian Air Force, the Regia Aeronautica, in 1938. The Freccia was maneuverable, but not as fast as British fighters. Top speed was under 300 miles an hour. The Matti Castoldi site that was also delightful to fly. It was faster than the G-50, but still much slower than its British opponents. Its dogfighting performance was excellent, and the G-50 could not be underestimated. The name Saeta means lightning. It saw more combat than any other Italian fighter throughout the Mediterranean and on the Eastern Front. These radial engine fighters were poorly armed. They also suffered because Italy had no powerful modern engines. Later, when German engines were fitted, the story was different. The sleek Marchi Castoldi C202 Folgore would easily dominate the P-40s and Hurricanes in Africa. Later versions of these fighters were equivalent in most respects to the Focke-Wulf FW190 or the North American Mustang. But reliability was poor. The Italian fighters were not robust enough to withstand the rigors of desert combat. The simpler and more rugged P-40s and Hurricanes could not outperform them, but they could outlast them. In the Soviet Union, in the first half of 1941, a new wave of fighters appeared. They were modern, low-wing monoplanes with retractable landing gear and enclosed cockpits. They needed development. They got it. One of the results was this aircraft, the Yuk-3. The design was simple and easy to maintain in the rough environment of the Russian front. In the Battle of Kursk in the summer of 1943, it showed that the Soviet Air Force was capable of matching the Luftwaffe. German pilots were told to avoid the Yak fighter without an oil cooler under the nose. <laughs> 
Soviet fighters teamed perfectly with the uniquely successful ground attack aircraft, the Ilushin Il-2 Shturmovik. Stalin proclaimed that the Shturmovik was as vital to the Soviet army as air or bread. It was tough and perfectly suited to close support work. It was so effective that German soldiers called it Black Death. Engine and pilot were well protected in a single armored structural unit. The Il-2 carried machine guns, cannon, rockets, and bombs. It had a most unlikely ground attack companion, an American fighter that was supplied to the British and the U.S. Army Air Forces and thought to be a failure. It was the Bell P-39 Air Cobra, called the P-400 in its export version. At Guadalcanal and in New Guinea, the P-39 shrugged off its poor reputation as a fighter. Pilots took advantage of its heavy cannon as an effective ground attack weapon against the Japanese. The P-39 was supplied in quantity to the Soviet Union under the Lend-Lease program. The Soviets also exploited its potential for ground attack. But some pilots managed to use it well in air-to-air -air combat. Soviet ace Alexander Prokrishkin scored 20 of his 59 victories in the Kuban campaign, flying a Bell P-39 Era Cobra. But P-39s in the Pacific were no match for the classic Japanese fighter of the war, the Mitsubishi A6M-0. The Zero was built in greater quantities and served longer and more widely than any other Japanese warplane. The A6M2 that attacked Pearl Harbor had a top speed of 331 miles an hour. The Zero was heavily armed. It had two 7.7 millimeter machine guns in the upper fuselage decking and two wing mounted 20 millimeter cannon. It weighed only 5,313 pounds fully loaded. Allied pilots were shocked by its agility. Early in the war, it was not uncommon for Japanese pilots to flaunt their skill by performing aerobatics during a dogfight. Lightweight and heavy armament expressed the Japanese offensive mentality. Its aircraft were there to do the shooting, not to be shot at. The Zero was designed as a carrier-based fighter. But the Japanese Navy also operated a land-based air force, and the Zero saw a great deal of land-based combat throughout the Pacific. The endurance of the Zero was one of its principal strengths. In 1941, it had a range that would not be matched by Allied fighters until 1944. The A6M was the first carrier-based fighter in the world to have the capability of outperforming land-based rivals. Before the Allies learned how to handle the Zero, a mystique grew about its capability. When an example was finally captured by the Americans and analyzed, the truth was revealed. It was an excellent original aircraft that achieved maneuverability and long range by the sacrifice of structural strength and safety equipment. Throughout the war, it was continuously upgraded. It was produced in greater quantities than any other Japanese combat aircraft. But the last version was not a fighter. It was designed for the one-way Kamikaze mission. One of the Zero's most famous opponents early in the war was the Grumman F4F Wildcat. The Wildcat was a little heavier than the Zero, just as fast, but not so maneuverable. <laughs> 
It was tremendously strong. An obvious feature of the Wildcat is the location of the landing gear wells and the fuselage. The Wildcat was originally designed as a biplane and then developed as a mid-wing monoplane. This is a group of Wildcats at Henderson Field on Guadalcanal. For a long time, the F-4F provided the lion's share of fighter strength on the island. Wildcat pilots developed team tactics to lure the Zero into their line of fire. Then their heavy 50 caliber machine guns could chop the lighter A6M to pieces. By the time the Wildcat came to hold its own against the Japanese fighters, Grumman was designing a purpose-built Zero killer. The process had to be quick. The lessons learned in the first months of the Pacific War had to be addressed in this new fighter. It was the F-6F Hellcat. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. By the end of the war, the Hellcat would rack up over 5,000 victories against about 250 losses. The Hellcat was a war winner. It was extremely maneuverable and rugged. It could take on the best Japanese aircraft and pilots in one-on-one -on -one combat. In just three years, Grumman built more than 12,600 F-6Fs, improving them continually. The British fleet air arm bought Hellcats and flew them from carriers in Europe and the Far East. The Hellcat's chief rival was the gull-winged Vought F-4U Corsair. It was known to the Japanese as the Whispering Death. It would remain in production longer than any other U.S. fighter from 1940 to 1952. 12 and a half thousand would be built. Its huge Pratt & Whitney R2800 radial engine generated 2100 horsepower for takeoff. The Corsair was extraordinarily rugged and versatile. For the Marines, it was a weapon that made the beloved Wildcat seem like a toy. It could lift huge ordnance loads and deliver them with precision. Its top speed was 446 miles an hour, and its range was just over 1,000 miles. Flying from land and from carrier decks, the Corsair achieved an 11 to 1 kill ratio against the Japanese. Some Japanese officers rated it the best fighter they faced. The Fokker Wolf FW190 was introduced into combat in Europe in 1941. It was the only Luftwaffe fighter to use a radial engine. It was about 30 miles an hour faster than the Spitfire 5 up to 25,000 feet. It had the fastest roll rate of all fighters in World War II. In June 1942, by accident, an FW-190 landed in England. The British already knew it was good, but now they were able to see up close just how technically superior it was. Not only was it advanced aerodynamically, it was a small target, was extremely strong and had excellent pilot visibility. <laughs> 
The 190 was also more heavily armed than its predecessors, with various combinations of machine guns and cannon. It appeared in a wide variety of versions, fighter, tank buster, torpedo bomber, and night interceptor. Some even had strengthened wing leading edges for ramming Allied bombers. The basic engines were BMW double row radials. Using their emergency boost system, they could punch out well over 2,000 horsepower. The long-nosed version, powered by a Junkers Jumo liquid-cooled engine, became the fastest fighter of the war, until the jets appeared. It could reach speeds of around 470 miles per hour. More than 20,000 aircraft in this outstanding line of fighters were produced. The Lockheed P-38 was an extraordinary airplane. It was the first twin-engine single-seat fighter ever put into mass production. Lockheed was new to military design. Its fighter was revolutionary. It looked different, was complex, and had initial testing problems. But its potential excited the Air Corps. It had its first kill on the day America entered the war. It would prove to be highly versatile. It was used for long-range escort, reconnaissance, and ground attack. The Lightning was never to be the success in the European theater that it became in the Pacific, but it was a valuable commodity in the North African desert. The twin engine safety and long range of the P-38 made it perfect for the Pacific War. Some P-38s were modified to extend their already long range. Some versions could carry large bomb loads. Others were developed as photographic reconnaissance aircraft. The Lightning, with its unmistakable twin boom silhouette, was one of the most versatile aircraft of the war. This is the immense bulk of the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, known as the Jug, one of the biggest and toughest fighters of the war. The Jug was designed around the Pratt & Whitney R-2800 double WASP radial engine, developing upward of 2,000 horsepower. It drove an enormous four-bladed propeller Republic was seeking speeds well above 400 miles an hour. The P-47 had elliptical wings, similar in plan to the Spitfire. It went into production in 1942. In early 1943, two fighter groups were equipped with the new giant. They joined the 8th Air Force in England to escort daylight precision bombing raids. But their initial range of less than 600 miles meant they couldn't take the bombers all the way deep into Germany. Drop tanks helped, but the jug wasn't the answer to the long-range escort problem. 
These are early P-47s in service in England. Early models were called Razorbacks because of the raised fuselage profile behind the pilot. The devastating firepower of the Jug made it perfect for another role. It became a deadly ground attack bomber. It was produced in large numbers and carved a fearsome reputation in Europe and the Pacific. Almost 16,000 were produced. Deliveries continued until the end of the war. By then, its speed and range had been increased to levels undreamed of before Pearl Harbor. The prototype of the North American P-51 Mustang was completed in just 102 days. It was soon evident that North American had produced the best American fighter to date. But the U.S. Army Air Forces only bought two for test purposes. The early Mustang's Allison engine handicapped its performance at high altitude. It was recommended that the Mustang be fitted with the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. It was a marriage made in heaven. Merlin gave the Mustang outstanding high altitude performance. An 85 gallon tank was installed, squeezed in behind the pilot. This made the Mustang unstable until some fuel had been burned off. But it now had endurance of seven and a half hours, enough for the round trip to Berlin. The long range escort fighter had at last arrived. The P-51 was fast and agile. It had no handling vices. It was a fighter pilot's dream. This is film of an RAF squadron of Mustangs in 1942. Some early RAF versions operated as high-speed, low-altitude reconnaissance aircraft. The next model would have a sliding bubble canopy, retaining the high fuselage profile behind the pilot. Then would come the familiar straight-back version with the teardrop canopy. Most of the P-51 variants served in Europe. Their main mission was the vital one of escorting daylight bombing raids deep into Germany, all the way to Berlin and beyond, and then back home. The P-51 was the only aircraft of the war capable of doing it. Almost 16,000 Mustangs were produced. Its career was not finished with the end of the war. At least 55 nations used it in the period when world military aviation began transitioning to jets. More P-51s continue to fly than any other World War II warbird. Just as remarkable in its own way as the P-51 Mustang was the British de Havilland Mosquito. De Havilland planned it in 1938 as a high-speed day bomber. It was to be built of wood because of the demand on metal supplies. But the Air Ministry wasn't interested. They should have been. When they reluctantly gave the Mosquito the go-ahead, they found themselves with an effective and versatile aircraft that served in an extraordinary range of roles for the rest of the war. 
Lolita was a bomber, a fighter bomber, reconnaissance aircraft, high altitude fighter, torpedo fighter, and more. Almost 8,000 were built in Britain, Australia, and Canada. Almost as versatile was the Mosquito's twin-engine companion, the Bristol Bowfighter. The Bowfighter was an initiative of the Bristol Airplane Company which wanted to build a tough, cannon-armed, multi-role fighter. Construction was based on the existing Bristol Beaufort and could begin rapidly. It took only six months to get it into the air. It was in service by May 1940. It operated as a night fighter in the Blitz and then on all fronts throughout the war. Like the Mosquito, it was extremely versatile. It packed enormous firepower. It could deliver bombs, rockets, torpedoes, and cannon barrages. It was equally feared by the Luftwaffe and the Japanese. Another deliverer of intense British firepower was the Hawker Typhoon. It recovered from a disastrous early career to cut ground attack swathes across Europe from English bases in the months before D-Day. After the invasion of Europe, it proved capable of effective operation from forward airstrips. It harassed German ground forces and tanks without mercy. The Northrop P-61 Black Widow was a purpose-built night fighter. It was designed from the start to carry radar in the nose. It shared the P-38's twin engine, twin boom layout and had a very advanced wing design using spoilers for lateral control. It entered service with the Army Air Forces in the South Pacific in 1944. It served successfully there and in Europe for the rest of the war. It was enormous for a fighter with a wingspan of 66 feet but it was fast and agile. Without question, the single most advanced aircraft the Germans put into the field was the Messerschmitt Me-262 jet fighter. This is one of the early development versions before the fitting of the tricycle landing gear. With its swept wings, heavy armament, and 540 miles an hour top speed, it was easily the best fighter of the war. The fighter version was called the Swallow. The bomber version, favored by Hitler for years, was called the Stormbird. It was a beautiful aircraft, but its pilots liked it for more than aesthetic reasons. By the time it began to appear in service in late 1944, the Allies dominated the air. The Me-262s gave Luftwaffe pilots at least a slim chance for survival. About 1,433 were delivered to the Luftwaffe, but only about 300 got into operation. Production of the 262 was delayed 
because of the difficulty of producing a satisfactory number of the radical new jet engines. If the utmost priority had been placed on the development of the jet engine from 1939, the 262 could have entered service in mid-1943. If it had, the air war over Europe would have been vastly different. Germany and Britain were developing the jet engine at the same time. Britain's first operational jet fighter was the Gloucester Meteor. Like the MA262, it took a long time to develop and was not ready to enter service until July 1944. Its major contribution to the war was chasing German V1 flying bombs. It set a world speed record in 1945 and laid the foundation for Britain's post-war jet air force. The most extreme and radical aircraft of the war was the Messerschmitt Me-163 Comet. It was a rocket-powered flying wing interceptor designed to reach the greatest possible height in the shortest possible time. It flew at 624 miles an hour in 1941. That was such a fantastic feat that any self-respecting Allied spy would have refused to believe it. It worked. In 1944 and 45, it damaged Allied bomber formations. But there was almost as much hazard to the pilot in each flight from the volatile rocket fuels as there was to high-flying Allied aircraft. It was a brave concept, but it could not win the war for the Luftwaffe. 